we've got, we got a broken lance, everybody. Yeah. The action is coming thick and fast. As I say, this is 13th century jousting, my friends. <laughs> Not the type you'd see with the tilt in the middle. This yeah. is no holds barred. <laughs> oh, we've got another broken lance, my friends. <laughs> Here we go, the Argo there just showing off. <laughs> and it, oh, wonderful work there from the Wyvern, Sir Lancelot taking a public. Oh, and the Wild Man, oh, unfortunately, he's taken a blow. Good Jason there, cracking his lance upon the Wyvern shield. And we got a, oh, right in the chest from Sir Lancelot there. Oh, the action coming thick and fast. There we are, who shall take home the celebrity of being the winner of the Jazz today? Oh, we've got a double kill there, my friends. <laughs> Wonderful work. Scarborough Castle. Hold my good night. Hold. Oh, Sir Lancelot. You, you absolute cheat. I cried hold and lo, he carried on with his strikes and his parries. Seems Sir Lancelot does not only cheat in the bedroom but on the field of battle as well. <laughs> So here, my good friends. It feels like summer. It feels like summer. Oh, it feels like summer. Horse the Shire horse. The lever forced in the middle means the weight of a rider actually puts more pressure in the middle of their backs. And they're also very big. And when a knight horse that isn't particularly possible. So when you have horses of the size that we have before you here, these riders can get on their horses in full armour by themselves with no bother at all. So these are the optimum sized horses for training for war and for battle. Now the big black horse we have here is called Fallon. He is a stallion, he's a little horse, especially one as imposing as the stallion Faron. So we work them slowly. We work them with each other, closing, going away, closing again, so that they become used to working with other horses. And we have to remember that horses are prey animals. They're specifically designed to run away from things that are scary. So to make them work with us in a team, in a situation that is the very opposite of their natural inclination, it takes time and understanding. So we perform exercises such as the one here to increase confidence. Cayetano is learning that if he walks towards another horse, it may yield to him. And this will teach him to attack things later that he's not sure about. Once he's learned that things he is afraid of move away from him, this is afraid of. We also have to acclimatize him to the noises of the battlefield. You can hear the swords here, they're clanging against each other, grating against each other. Now, infantry were not hugely well trained in the 13th century. They tended to be levies, but horsemen and knights would sometimes dismount and fight on foot. And we have to get horses used to this as well. Now humans are predators, horses are prey, and we are trying to teach them to go towards the predators here in the middle of the arena. So what we do is we space them out in a big space and we ride through them so that their horses can learn that the infantry are no threat. 
sometimes we attack them so they can get to hear the sounds of battle and learn that those sounds are not a threat to them themselves. And in this way, we build up the horse's confidence slowly and steadily, bit by bit, over days and weeks and months and years, until they are infantry killers. Now, a great many people would suspect that a horse would not be particularly willing to charge a wall of shields and pointy spears, but this, we turn out, as we will be able to prove, is not the case. Once the horses are comfortable attacking infantry, they will push them over, and some horses who are particularly inclined will actively find people to run over, which we haven't told the infantry in the arena. So Cayetano here, he hasn't done this, he may have done this once, but certainly not more than that. He's becoming acclimatised to the infantry, he's riding through them in a nice trot, and he's looking quite calm. He's not shying away, so what we will do is we will make the gap smaller. This ups the level of difficulty for the horse, gives it a little more to think about, and is a step closer to what they would face on the battlefield with the closed ranks of the infantry that the knights of the 13th century would be normally happy to charge. And again, this is an iterative process designed to make the horses bored and obedient to the rider. And you can see Farrell is going through a gap only very slightly bigger than himself. He's not looking twice at it, and he's being so calm that the rider is able to attack the infantry on his way by. <laughs> and we can see at this point the effect of a horse against the infantry. So far we've spoken about acclimatising the horse to the men on the ground, but what we haven't covered is how the men on the ground have to face the horses. And if you are one of those men standing in the middle of the arena when Farron thun thunders past you, it is a distinctly unnerving experience. And they're doing very well holding still, even though one of them just got a little bump on the knee. And you can see, if you could imagine a thousand of these horses cantering at you, maybe you would run away. <laughs> now the infantrymen there are a bit worried about their toes. <laughs> and you can see the horse itself is a weapon. When, when the full charge comes crashing through, the infantry standing in the way, it's not just the lance pointed at their face that they're going to be worried about. It's the hooves and the half a tonne of horse flesh that's going to trample them, knock them to the ground, crush their limbs, split their helmets open and really ruin their day. I think we should have a round of applause for our bravery against infantry on the ground, acclimatising the horse to the noise of steel on steel and manoeuvring around the battlefield. Tight turns are good. Again, if you're trying to get to the back left shoulder of your opponent, whoever can turn the quickest is going to win. So whoever is the best trained horse, whoever is the best rider, is probably going to be the victor in any particular duel. And again, this is something we do every day. We train our horses with all the different noises and things that they might, might encounter on the battlefield. So that they are happy under pressure. You can see Farrell there turned a complete circle with no reins whatsoever. He's going to come round again. And in this way the rider is able to engage many more targets in a much more flexible way than if he did require the reins for steering. So Farrell moving up into a trot as he circles his enemy and you can see how the manoeuvrability and the ability to cover ground quickly is one of the greatest assets of a horse. If our infantryman wanted to chase our horse off, he's going to be tired extremely quickly, whereas our mounted rider can literally do this all day. And this is why riding horses made medieval knights so fearsome. A fixed battle was very rare. Most medieval warfare was a riding war. It was a war of raiding and pillaging, but covering ground was the name of the game. Everyone was mounted, and you could go and avoid big armies and go and ransack their towns when they weren't looking, because you had the speed of the horses. 
And this is why horsemanship was an integral part of the chivalry of the 13th century, and why every knight needed to train a horse, needed to know how to ride, and be comfortable for very extended periods in the saddle. See, our infantryman is happy just to stand still because he doesn't want to tire himself out, and is ably demonstrating the superior maneuverability and speed of a horse. I mean, can we have a round of applause for Farron and his new 